Shalom, everybody. I'm starting a minute and a half early tonight. I'm scheduled to start at nine o'clock, but I'm hoping to keep everyone on their toes, keep everyone prompted on time. Give you guys a couple of minutes to show up. Uh, starting out here, might as well, we're looking at my websites and I do this each week, but I never know when uh, someone new may jump into this study who hasn't been a part of the first two. So this is the Unexpected Cosmology. It's my website. And uh, we're, of course, a ministry, but also uh, we uh, publish books and you could see our store over here. Actually, on the very top, I have the Torah Abides, Paul's Letter to the Galatians According to the Law of Yah. And it, I'm actually I'm writing this live. I'm in the, the second chapter right now. Uh, but why am I selling the ebook? Well, this is so that people can read along because the audience loves reading along. And. Of course, you know, as I update this with every chapter, you can go and you can get the new uh, chapter. So same cost, you know, you're not, it's not charging you again. Uh, so just that's one of the ways you can support the ministry. And I hope you guys enjoy this study. I'm going to jump right into it tonight. Now, uh, that was, <laughs> that was from the last video I did. Wrong page. Okay. Uh, that was talking about the Mark of the Beast. So last week, actually the last two weeks, uh, I have had so many problems getting this Galatians study uh, recorded, and I've had tech issues. I'm hoping tonight will go smooth. Um, I originally did part two, which was like verses six through nine, and and I had to scrap that whole thing after being live. I scrapped the whole thing, started again. And then last Tuesday, a week ago, uh, it was just... It was getting glitchy in the internet. It, the internet went down in my neighborhood. Okay. Like the, all, all like down the street and it was going and it was going on and off for the rest of the night. And uh, so I'm going to just start off on verse nine. I think that's where it really started getting glitchy. And I decided not to re-record that. I decided to leave that recording up as a testimony to how difficult this has been to get up. And this is not a pop popular subject by any means, guys. Uh, you've got most of the people, most of the Christians in the world, the Christians, the Catholics, the Orthodox, you name it, um, all saying that Paul is their boy. He's the one that did away with the Torah. He's the one that proves that you no longer have to keep the commands because of Paul. And, um, and then... It, yeah. And then you got another a lot another large group of people when they come to the the commands, the Torah, and they realize that it's eternal and that it's for everybody, and that it's for those who are in a you know, everybody who is in a covenant with Yahuwah, that would be Yahweh. Even if you want to say Jesus Christ, Yahusha Hamashiach, uh, that it's it's eternal. The Sabbath has not been done away with, you know, the, the Clean animals have not, uh, I'm sorry, unclean animals have not become clean again, so on and so forth. When they realize this, they throw Paul out because they're like, Paul clearly doesn't hold up to the De Deuteronomy 13 test. And I went over the Deuteronomy 13 test. I highly recommend everyone check out the first video. Uh, the first part, the first two are really, they're all important. So maybe you should just do them all in order, but let's get right into this. Um, again, so I'm saying that this isn't the most popular subject. And, um, but it's, it's a vital, vitally important subject. You know, the truth is not popular at the end of the day. I've had so many people coming and tell me, no, why are you doing this series? Why are you talking about Galatians? You know, and, uh, you know, yeah. Do they, do less people watch these videos? Sure. The truth is not uh, popular, but the truth is the truth. The great thing about the truth is that the truth is the truth, rather, whether we uh, believe it is the truth or not. It doesn't cease being the truth. That's the amazing thing about it. All right, Galatians 1.9. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other bazora unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, <laughs> this is like three verses in a row. Uh, I was getting this momentum, and so I really should go back and do one seven one eight. I'm not going to. You can look in the last video, but... It's this momentum where Paul is just going on and accursed, I tell you. Whoever preaches any other bizarre, he is accursed. Dang, Paul, still harping on about the accursed. We get it. We get it. Or or do we? Lawless Christians will claim they have assured me beyond a reasonable doubt. And in fact, I haven't heard the last of it. 
that he was calling the Torah people out as the accursed, those who were uh, being obedient to the commands, you know, keeping the Sabbath day, so on and so forth. Well, dang again, then, because not even Balaam could go through with it. He, he couldn't even go through with cursing Yasharel. Leave it to the people who claim to love Jesus to curse the righteous. Interestingly enough, the anti-Paul crowd will state the same thing, but from the opposite side of the battle line, except they take it to the next logical conclusion. They insinuate it is Yaakov and Kepha, that would be James and Peter, and the Yerushalayim church who is being accursed by the villainous Paul, curling his French mustache while he pins his letters. Apparently, Paul is writing a hit piece, more like damage control, against the Yerushalayim group. Because they both proclaim two separate Bazora messages, you see. And like Highlander, there can be only one. Now, mind you, I'm going through all this, showing that there are not two gospel messages. There is only one going all the way back to Sinai. All right. The gospel did not come about uh, in Matthew. It wasn't prophesied by Isaiah. No, no, no. The, the, the Bazora, the gospel message, there's only one. It goes all the way back to Sinai, at least before that. But you can say, you know, without a doubt, at Sinai, it was brought forward. So we'll, here we have Paul stating repeatedly that he is preaching the one true Bezora, unlike some others who are going about handing out an accursed Bezora, which according to 2 Peter 2, 14 through 15, lines up with the way of Balaam. The accursed Bezora is the lawless one, giving credence to sin. Why does Paul keep badgering the point? Is he attempting to break up the Bezora monopoly held by the Yerushalayim group? That's what many of my contemporaries will have you believe. Well, if I had to guess, I think the worst case scenario is that he is overcompensating. Nothing wrong with that. I suppose it has something to do with the lack of trust, which the Torah-based Messianic congregations and probably even members of the Yerushalayim group had in him. Paul was a grade A flip-flopper from one extreme to another. He literally went from a persecutor of the Kodashim from the set apart to an apostle of them. Regarding his footwear, the flip-flops, allow me time to develop, develop that thought in the passages ahead. I mean, it's the very backstory to the epistle which we are now discussing. The, the lack of trust people had in Paul and all the, the controversy that you know came up in his uh, bizarre message and many people claiming that it wasn't the true bizarre. The short of it is that Paul didn't simply become a lawless patsy in the centuries after his death. The rumors as to his Balaam apostasy had already begun and, in fact, were already viciously circulating among the pews in the years, months, and weeks leading up to this letter. It's why he keeps saying repeatedly, whatever anyone tells you, and of course I'm kind of like paraphrasing here, but whatever anyone tells you, I choose the blessing of Sinai rather than the curse. My bazaar, which I offer, is the one true bazora of the kingdom first handed to us at Sinai, wherein the blessing is given. I want nothing to do with, nor am I an advocate for those who choose the curse in, in following Balaam. Clearly, the matter is so important to Paul because he was dealing with backsliders who were falling into a message contrary to the Torah. Since you're still here and I apparently have your attention, some of your attention, I might as well use this instance to insert a favorite passage of mine, seeing as how the false bazora, the way of Balaam, is still hot on the platter. And see, this is where I, I really, I had the momentum going of the last few verses. So sorry, I'm picking up here. You could refer to what I'm talking about last week. Not everyone that saith unto me, Adonai, Adonai, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Adonai, Adonai, or Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And some versions say uh, workers of lawlessness, which is the same thing. In, it's the same thing as saying workers of Torahlessness. Yahushua is speaking of those who know him and don't know him. The shocking part about this passage is the sheer number of people who think they know him or that they are known by him when in fact they are not. 
The reason being that they are workers of iniquity, though many translations say lawlessness, as I just pointed out, which is the same thing as Torahless rather than righteousness. And of course, keeping the, you know, the, the Torah itself is, is righteous. M might I say on the behalf of many, ouch. Remember when I quoted from Yochanan Rishon, that would be 1 John 2, 1 through 6, the text align. The proof of knowing Allah Hayam, and that would be, remember, God the Father, and just as importantly, being known by him is in the pudding, keeping the Father's commands. It says that in 1 John 2, 1 through 6. The Bible says that. It's not me saying it. It's the Bible saying it. And yet I get told all the time by the Torah haters that they needn't keep the commands because they cast out demons in Jesus's name. This is what I actually get told. People are like, I don't need that. None of that is, is applicable to my life. I don't need to keep the Sabbath. I can eat pork. I can do all that stuff. Uh, it, it's okay because I cast out demons in Jesus' name. They actually claim an association with Yahushua HaMashiach based upon their tongue speak, their, their babbling, or their miracles, or their ability to cast out demons. How scary is that? Or in some de in some denominations, rolling around on the floor, barking like a dog. I guess like in in the Holy Spirit or whatever whatever is going on there. Haven't they read this passage, or are they simply blind? Spiritual blindness is my guess. One's ability to be blinded to the light should cause all of us to humble ourselves and weep for the arrogance of the masses. So many people will go through their entire lives proclaiming. Jesus rebukes you only to learn that they'd followed the doctrine of Balaam all along. And that's tragic. Let's see what this says here. This comes from a book of the Illuminators or also a book of the Nazarim. It's a phenomenal read. Some, some hail me as their leader, thinking this will help them in the life to come, but it will not. Only those who wholeheartedly serve the cause and purpose of Allah Hayam will enjoy this in full glory. Many who do things in my name will expect me to intercede for them. Why is that so familiar? But to these I will say, I did not know you or authorize the statements you made. By your deeds, not your words, but by your deeds, you will be judged. Again, ouch. A parallel to Matthew can be found in the Book of the Illuminators, though uh, some of you know it as the Book of the Nazarene. And of course, it comes from Britain through Joseph of Arimathea. Again, phenomenal book. Look it up. It's in our store at Tuck. I'm adding it to the pile of witnesses because the message is even clearer in this one. Christians tell me all the time how Jesus lived a perfect life so that they didn't have to, which is completely different, mind you, from saying he lived the perfect life that we could not, or that he set the example that we should live. Let's not confuse the doctrine of Balaam from the high priest of our atonement. They say they will, they say they will, this is what I, this is what I was, what I grew up being told directions. Like literally, you know how like Egyptians will prepare their whole lives for when they die and they have all these instructions uh, for when, when they actually are mummified and you know how they're supposed to navigate to the after afterlife. I was given the instructions, pure doctrines of men. I was given the instructions my entire life. When you die and you go up to heaven, don't say anything. Just point to Jesus. Just point, point, point at him. That's all you need to do. So they say they will point to Jesus in the throne room and expect him to intercede on their behalf, despite their lifetime of willful, conscious, law-breaking habits. Well, it looks like Mashiach was way ahead of the game. Included with the I did not know you statement is the part where he adds or authorize the statements you made, the doctrines you made, the teachings you made, the, the, the I don't have to do this, the lawlessness. Just because enough pastors are proclaiming the doctrine of Balaam from the loudspeaker, from the pulpit, doesn't make it true. To close this out, it is by our deeds that we shall be judged. Hopefully I'm coming in nice and clear to you guys tonight. Here we are, uh, Galatians verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. And you guys know my policy. At the top of every verse, got to drink a little bit more coffee. Keep it fresh. For, for do I now persuade men or Allah Hayam? Or do I seek to please men? 
For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Mashiach. But I certify you, brethren, that the Bezorah which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelations of Yehusha HaMashiach. Believe it or not, we have just been given a massive clue as to who was going about perverting the kingdom Bezorah, the kingdom gospel. And we haven't even arrived at Galatians 2.14 quite yet, the all-popular Judaizer Bible memory verse. You know, anyone who keeps the commands, they're apparently a Judaizer. Anyone who keeps the Sabbath, you know, they're a Judaizer. Totally just twisting Paul's words. They were the parashim, and those would be the Pharisees, okay? It's the Pharisees. Those are the, the people pulling people into a false gospel. If you commit to a Google search, you will find hundreds of returns which insist the Judaizers were the Christian Torah keepers, which again is a passive-aggressive way of pointing the finger at the Yerushalayim crew. Wrong. They were the Pharisees, a.k.a. well, the Parashim, a.k.a. the Pharisees in English. Figuring that much out was the easy part. All it took was a few minutes of cross-referencing, a lost art form by the looks of it. The key phrase in all of this is men. Persuading men, pleasing men, anything to do with men rather than Allah Hayam. And I already know where this conversation is going because I've seen it unfold already a countless number of times. Yep, must be the, uh, the Pharisee spoken about then. I can't seem to go anywhere on social media without card carrying license to send Christians, throwing Yahusha's rebukes down when apparently to reveal the reveal the error of my ways. You see, the logic is, if Yahushua rebu uh, rebuked the Pharisees and I seek repentance from my transgressions of the Torah, then I must be the Pharisee whom Yahushua rebuked. Admit it. One or two of you listening to this uh, video at some point or reading this were thinking that. I mean, that's what I was taught. I was taught that the, the, the he rebuked the Pharisees for being too zealous, for being works-based, right? So let me see if I got this right. Yahushua rebuked the Pharisees for being works-based and keeping the Torah. And that's really what works-based is code for, keeping the commands. That, that's what it's code for. While praising the Goyim for being disobedient to it, is that what Yahushua HaMashiach did? Does that just about sum it up? Let me say that again. Did he Yahushua rebuke the Pharisees for being work-based and keeping the Torah while praising the Goyim, the Gentiles, for being disobedient to it? Worst deductive argument ever. Before the minute, let's roll with the punches and go with it, rather than simply taking your word for it or my own, because I'm one of those chapter and verse people. We'll turn to Matthew to see why Yahushua rebuked the Pharisees. Let, let's see why he actually did it. As usual, I'll present the passage, pausing afterwards for comment. So this comes from, as I said, uh, this is Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Then came to Yahusha, scribes and uh, perishim. And you could, uh, you could actually translate scribes as teachers of the Torah, of the law, which were of Yerushalayim, saying, why, why do your Talmudim transgress the Tikunim, the uh, tikunim of the elders. That would be tradition. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of Allah Hayam by your tradition? For Allah Hayam commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother. And he that curses his father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever you might be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of Allah Hayam of no effect by your tradition, ye hypocrites. Well did Yeshiyahu prophesy of you, saying, that would be Isaiah, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So there's that word men again, all right? Uh-oh, the scene opens with the scribes and the Pharisees arriving from Yerushalayim to draw near to Yahusha, probably up to no good. 
you will tell me the word Talmudim is not in your Bible, and why am I promoting the Talmud? Talmudim is just a Hebrew word for students or disciple. Pythagoras. I, actually, Pythagoras, excuse me, not Pythagoras, Pythagoras. He had disciples. Socrates had disciples. Plato had disciples. Aristotle had disciples. Oh, so I painstakingly watched much of the Oliver Stone movie uh, before turning that New Orleans Pride Parade off. Uh, Alexander and most of Aristotle's Talmudim were hand-holding gay lovers. That's the Oliver Stone movie, Alexander. But then again, everybody here mentioned derived from the mystery religions and secret societies. Therefore, there are good Talmudim and there are bad Talmudim. We should choose to be good Talmudim and not the Talmudim of the Talmud. But how can we know the good from the bad? Well, certainly Yahushua would know. You will immediately tell me the Pharisees are protesting Yahushua on the basis that his disciples, his Talmudim, are transgressing the Torah and that Yahushua is okay with it, and that furthermore, I should too. Yeah, I've heard that one a thousand times before as well. Time for Daddy to pull off his leather belt and give those works-based religious people another solid rebuking, it seems. That's where the word uh, tikkunim, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, excuse me, it always looks better on the page, and then I can't pronounce it, comes in as an important part of this discussion, and it simply means a man-made reg regulation, amendment, or improvement to the Torah something which is not a part of the original commandment of Allah Hayyam. Many translations simply, simply state traditions. Therefore, the Pharisees cannot possibly be protesting Yahushua for disobeying the Torah, as clearly they're protesting, protesting him for rejecting their own man-made traditions. Think of it like a denomination, right? And they have all their bullet points, which has may have nothing to do with the Bible, but if you do not believe these bullet points, if you don't sign off on them, then you're ostracized. You're out. I mean, their statement regarding the washing of hands when eating bread. I can't find that command anywhere in the Torah. Can you? Must be one of those man-made improvements to the Bible then. I've rehearsed this passage repeatedly and in numerous different translations. Kind of sounds like Yahushua is rebuking the Pharisees for transgressing the commandments of Allah Hayyam to me. But then, why are they transgressing the law exactly? Yahushua doesn't leave us hanging because they have their own traditions which says to do otherwise. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Where have we heard that one before? There's a whole lot of traditions in the Catholic and Christian church and the Orthodox as well, which advocates an improvement to and freedom from the Torah, from Torah obedience. That's probably just a coincidence. I'm sure that has nothing to do with the Pharisees. Surely Yahushua couldn't possibly be addressing anybody else who advocates the same message as the Pharisees. But then there it is again, verse 6. The Pharisees are transgressing the commandments of Allah Hayyam, even going so far as to make them of no effect by their tradition. Seems like I'm picking up on a pattern. Wasn't that a song in Fiddler on the Roof? Tradition, tradition, tradition. I'm not going to sing it. You guys know what I'm talking about. How can anyone claim Yahushua was scolding them for being works-based when you can't very well obey your parents unless a work is involved? If anything, they were not being zealous enough for the Torah. Contrarily, disobeying one's parents would make the Torah ineffective. Seems legit. I've yet to see a concise, deductive argument anywhere except one which has Messiah declaring Torah obedience. Perhaps there will be a surprising twist to his conclusion, except there isn't one. Verses 7 through 9, it really doesn't get any clearer than that. If it is our goal to worship Allah Hayyam in vain, then Yahushua tells us how to go about doing it. Listen carefully. Teach for doctrines the commandments of men. Oh dear, he doesn't leave us a third option, does he? So far, I have only read two options. There is the Torah of Allah Hayyam or the traditions of men. Take your pick. One or the other. But you can't have both. You can devote your entire life to worshiping Jesus while snubbing the Torah and think he will be okay with that. But Messiah says otherwise. Yahushua was quoting from Yeshiyahu, so Isaiah. Let's give it a read just to make sure he wasn't misquoting anything because you never really know. So this is uh, Isaiah 29, 13 through 14. Wherefore, Yahuwah has said, 
For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid. Wowzers! Yahushua fell in agreement with the Torah observant prophet Yeshayahu, who in turn fell in agreement with Yahuwah. Apparently, Yahushua didn't come to undo his father's work after all. Go figure. It says right here what will happen to those who honor Yahuwah with their lips while obstinately clinging to the traditions of men. Wisdom shall perish and understanding will be hidden from them. Not good. There's that spiritual blindness that plagues the Torah hater group. They can't see it. Like they, they read the Bible and they just don't see it. And it's just black and white, crystal clear. Perhaps this is all just a fluke. Maybe I'm just selectively choosing scripture, which only appears to advocate for our Heavenly Father's instructions and in righteous living. You tell me. I mean, that's why I get told all the time that I, I'm like selectively choosing scripture as if Allah, I'm as if God is bipolar, like as if he tells you, obey it. Oh, don't obey it. Obey it. No, 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 don't obey it. Like, no, that's not the Bible. That's nowhere in there. A Pharisee is still defined as a works-based Torah observant individual no matter what this particular passage has to say on the matter. Fine. Then let's find another confrontation between Yahushua and the, and the Pharisees. A second witness, if you will. The same, the same story can be found in the Gospel of Mark. And then there came to Yahushua some of the uh, perishim and the wise ones of the old law who came from Yerushalayim. And when they saw some of his Talmudim eating without ritually washing hands, they despised them. For the Yahudim, the Yahudim do not eat unless they always wash their hands ritually according to the decree of the ancient ones. Also, there are many other statutes that they command them to keep, that is, to richly wash their lids and silver drinking vessels. And because of this, they asked Yahushua, saying, Why are your Talmudim not keeping the decrees of the ancient fathers, but eat bread with, with richly unwashed hands all the day? So Yahushua answered, saying to them, well, did Yeshayahu prophesy of you deceivers, saying, This people honor me by word, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they honor me, teaching the instructions and commandments of men. So they forsake the commandments of El, while holding on to whatever was delivered of men, and came to them concerning cups and their silver drinking vessels, and likewise many other things. And like these words, he said to them, you are breaking the commandments of Yahuwah in order to keep your own institutions. You see what I'm highlighting in red here? For Moshe said, honor your father and your mother, and whoso curses his father or his mother must certainly die. But you say that anything of them which a man vows because he made a vow, his father and mother should profit him. And afterwards, you do not allow him to repay the father and mother. Thus you are breaking the commandments of Yahuwah on account of your institutions, which you obtain, and many e other evils you do. That comes from Mark 7, 1-9. through 9. In conclusion, a Pharisee is someone who obstinately breaks the commands of Allah Hayam and teaches others to do the same in order to honor Yahuwah by their own man-made traditions. All lips, no heart, don't be a Pharisee. And so, Re reading Galatians 1, 10 through 12 again. And this is what Paul says. For do I now persuade men or Allah I am, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Mashiach. But I certify you, brother, that the bizarre which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelations of Yahushua HaMashiach. Impressive. The gospel had supposedly not been written yet when Paul committed these words to writing. Paul is starting to show more and more evidence that he was indeed personally instructed by Yahushua. Now, I'm going to point out here that the idea that's constantly put out there is that Paul, like he had like, it was almost like he went to Dagobah with uh, Yoda and he like was trained by Yahushua HaMashiach. You know, he went to some mountaintop and he just had these visions and he was being fed. That, no, it's no, that's, I don't think that's what he's saying at all. He's, 
this is becoming more and more clear to me as I'm going through this line by line. Paul is saying that he was taught by no man because his entire schooling, his entire education with the Pharisees was a wash. Or he was taught by men. All right. He wasn't taught by the apostles either. What was he taught by? The Torah, the Tanakh. Yahusha HaMashiach instructed him through the Ruach HaKadosh, through the scriptures. That's what he's saying. It's it's not like it, it's not what people are making this out to be. That's the one true bazaar he keeps getting back at. It's there in our Bible. Go back to Genesis, go to Exodus, read through it. There it is. You too can be taught by Yahusha Hamashiach. All right, Galatians 1:13. For ye have heard of my conversation and time past in Judaism, how that beyond measure I persecuted persecuted the called out assembly of Awahayam and wasted it. Now I purposely put there Judaism uh, to help people understand that he the, he's talking about modern Judaism comes from the Pharisees. All right. So uh, this is a, it was at that time a denomination. Now it has become a completely different religion. It is Judaism is not the religion of the Bible, but it's, it's the false gospel that Paul keeps talking about. False testimony is responsible for the stoning of Stephen. That is our phrase for the day, boys and girls, or in the very least, this particular passage, false testimony. Memorize and remember it well. Stephen is on record as being persecuted by Paul, and though he doesn't say it here, Stephen is most likely on Paul's mind when he talks about the uh, uh, he persecuted the called out assembly. Stephen had to have been on his mind. And of course, Stephen advocated what? The Torah. The Jews couldn't have that, given their track record for murder. Mashiach, as you will recall, made the top of their list. Yahushua was hung from a tree, but then Stephen was stoned simply for being associated with him. The temple controllers were making a case as to why Mashiach and his entourage needed tossed from the land. Apparently, Yahushua and his co-conspirators had done away with the Torah, which is blatantly false testimony. And I'm going to get I'm going to show you this where it's coming from. That's how they that's how they killed Stephen by saying he did away with the Torah. Those accusations would continue with Yaakov, the brother of Yahusha, but that is another part of the story. In actuality, the Jews are the ones who had already done away with it. They we saw Yahusha said they, they went for the traditions of men, making the Torah of no effect. They don't teach that much in Sunday school, do they? That Stephen was deemed an apostate due to false testimony. It probably has something to do with the fact that they happen to agree with his accusers, seeing as how they too have deemed the Torah unnecessary for following Mashiach. How sad. It is what it, it is what it is, though. And I can only hope that my efforts here save one or two souls from the wide path of destruction. It would this whole effort would be worth it if we can just get one or two souls. Here is where we learn of Stephen's charges. So this comes from Ma'asim, that would be the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the ruach by which he, Stephen, spoke. And of course, we know that, uh, well, let's just keep reading. Then they uh, suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against who? Against Moshe and against Allah Hayam. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. Pause. The accusation against Stephen wasn't simply declaring Yahushua to be the son of Allah Hayam. That is what we're often taught. But it isn't so. He was arrested for speaking blasphemous words against Moshe as well as Allah Hayam. Blaspheming Moshe is the equivalent of inciting rebellion against the Torah given through him, as Korah and so many others had done in the wilderness. They were all killed as a result of it, and rightfully so. And just so we're clear, it is Yahuwah who ordered their deaths, not the other way around. Okay, it wasn't Moses that ordered it, it was Yahuwah. Moshe wasn't the, uh, wasn't the one who opened up the ground so that Korah and his fellow re uh, rebels went alive into Sheol. And anyways, if Stephen were advocating that the Torah had been done away with, then they would simply be following orders as given to them by the Allah Hayam of Yasharel. Stone him. That comes, as you guys hopefully know by now, from Deuteronomy 13. Be cautious before you come up with your arg argumentative response. 
it says they suborned men. Every translation that I can find uses the same word. The, de the definition of suborn means to bribe or otherwise induce someone to commit an unlawful act such as perjury. And that's against the Torah right there. No false witnesses. So they committed perjury then. The crowd, as well as the elders and the scribes, were stirred up against him, but only because they were lied to about the important details. They believed he was leading men towards the spirit of lawlessness to rebel against the Torah. The writer of Acts is telling us that the complete opposite of their accusation is true, though. Stephen was in no way inciting rebellion against Moshe or Allah Hayam, and yet the propaganda continues this very day from the pulpit. I wonder why. His obedience to Torah is all the more awkward when reading how they were not able to resist the wisdom of the Ruach HaKadosh as he spoke. The Ruach HaKadosh wasn't speaking against the Torah. No, the Ruach was speaking through the Torah and as an advocate of Torah, proving Yahushua to be the Mashiach they were after in Torah, and nobody else was capable of keeping up. Their only weapon against him was a lie. Notice, though, that they weren't simply lying about Stephen. They were also lying about the Ruach HaKadosh to say the followers of Mashiach were advocating disobedience to the Torah. Try not to let cognitive dissonance win the day. Continuing. So this is continuing in chapter 6. And they set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the Torah. For we have heard him say that this Yahusha, the, the Netzeri, the Nazarene, shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moshe delivered us. That's the false testimony. Yahushua never said he was going to change Moshe. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. That would be Stephen's face, the face of the angel. Supposing the reader should already forget that the stoning of Stephen was perpetrated upon false testimony, Dr. Lucas once again reminds us, dutifully so, that it is simply not true what the witnesses were claiming. Saying Stephen was speaking blasphemous words against the Torah was bearing false testimony. They knew it was a lie, but went ahead with their accusations anyways. And then it only gets worse. They furthermore claim to have personally heard Yahushua say he would change the customs which Moshe had delivered unto them. Lies. Yahushua said or did no such thing. Had he brought an end to the Torah, then he would be advocating the bizarre of the Antichrist, which is lawlessness, the spirit of lawlessness, or Torahlessness, and couldn't possibly have been the true Mashiach. The Yahudim knew that. They so desperately wanted Yahushua Yehush to be without Torah so that they could reject him and his followers, expelling them from the land. So let's read on. And Shaul, now this is Paul when he was known as Shaul, was consenting unto his death, unto Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the called out assembly, which was at Yerushalayim. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Yehud and uh, uh, Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carrying, carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Shaul, he made havoc of the called out assembly, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Who was standing among the crowd but everyone's favorite apostle, Shaul? Mm -hmm. The very Paul who apparently wrote letters declaring, the law has been done away with. We Look, either Paul is personally responsible for producing the false witnesses, or he believed the lies of his contemporaries to be true and responded accordingly. I have just given you two options. He was either lawless or mistaken through lawful. You can't be both. Claiming that Paul did produce false testimony, testimony only to have a vision from a Catholic and Protestant Jesus who told him the law was in fact done away with in favor of goyim traditions makes no sense whatsoever. If lawfulness is in any way navigable in this scenario, then what Luke should have said is that Shaul and the elders of Yashiro produced a true witness about Stephen thinking ironically that it was patently false, and that furthermore, 
Stephen either lied about Yahushua's intent or didn't receive the memo that Yahushua had indeed done away with the Torah, and what's more, that Shaul ended up siding with the very lie which he once invented, hoping to stir the crowd on every occasion. Did you catch all of that? Yeah, it's ridiculous. But that is how we're expected, expected to think about this situation. My head hurts simply trying to make sense of Antichrist theology. For Shaul to approve of Stephen's stoning, the most likely explanation, given the story arc before us, is that he was convinced that the false testimony given by his brethren was true concerning Yahusha and his followers, meaning he was zealous and he, he believed he believed the false testimony that uh, Stephen and the disciples and Yahusha had done away with the Torah. The other Yahudim wound him up like a toy when, when lying to him and then set him loose. There were no letters written yet which might declare the Torah was done away with. Whoopee! All Shaul had was the Torah and the Tanakh at his disposal. And reports, false reports, accordingly. Now keep in mind, he had, he had never heard Yahushua's teachings in person. We have no record of that. He's simply told of this terrible, this man who claimed to be the Messiah, who was leading people into lawlessness. And he's like, okay, we got to do something about this. Accordingly, he was doing precisely what the uh, what Yahuwah had instructed him to do in Deuteronomy 13. And so war broke out against the so-called lawless. Hmm. I wonder, when was the last time that a war broke out without propaganda attached to it? Exactly. War could never exist apart from rebellion and lies. How many people are still operating according to the intended outcome of that psyop? I wonder. That is the entire story arc of Acts, you know. True testimony, uh, true testimony versus false testimony. And of course, Galatians uh, is all about, you know, Paul's testimony and backing him up and saying, no, 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 no. I, I, would, I am not lawless like the claim out there. And of course, Acts backs him up. It begins with the true testimony of the Ruach HaKadosh in the upper room. The apostles declared to the nation what has happened on Pentecost. And that prophecy has been fulfilled. For the rest of the book, it becomes a struggle for the apostles to clear themselves of accusations, all of which has originated with the propaganda machine. Even Kepha, that'd be Peter, has to explain himself among Yaakov and the Yerushalayim group after rumors persist that he had given up a kosher lifestyle, which is in no way true. He's like, no, guys, no, I, I'm still eating clean. For the remainder of the story, as put forward by Luke, Shaul Paul received the brunt of those accusations. It started with his conversion and then haunted him for the remainder of his life and even long afterwards up to this very day. The mere fact that we are having this conversation just goes to show that the ministry of truth was a wild success, despite scripture repeatedly telling us to pay them no mind. More from Acts, uh, chapter this time chapter 9. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Yerushalayim and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Shaul increased the more in strength and confounded the Yahudim which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Mashiach. And how did he prove it? But with the Bible, right? The Torah. The Yahudim who'd once sided with Shaul were confounded, but only because the town marshal had now reversed his position entirely, siding with the people he'd been going around arresting. He's claiming their innocence, not their guilt. The previous reports which had motivated, motivated him were simply not true. So he's, he's reversed his position. No, they are not the lawless ones. And you can see it like for the rest of his life. He's like, the Pharisees know you're the lawless ones. He points the finger at them. It says he proved that Yahushua was Mashiach, meaning he upheld Moshe. How would he pull something like that off exactly without first switching his position, and agreeing that the man from Nazareth was the fulfillment of Torah? Or are we expected to believe he was still falling in disagreement with Stephen? That's the problem with Christian now, Christians nowadays. They play a game of Red Rover, calling upon the Jews to come right over. And the Jews are standing there thinking, why would I ever hold hands? with your rebellion against the Torah. Continuing. 
Ma'asim, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Yahudim took counsel to kill him, but their, but their laying await was known a shell. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the Talmudim took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. In making the argument that Yahushua and his crew were dutifully following the Father's commands, he was in fact exposing the accusers. It was they who had either done away with the Torah. Uh, it was they who weren't keeping it. Therefore, the perishing wanted revenge. Some translations say they conspired against Paul, whereas here we read how they took counsel against him. Same thing. However phrased, it was the same old bag of tricks. Accused Mashiach of breaking the Torah. Accused Stephen of breaking the Torah. Accused Paul of the same. The false testimony which he had once employed as a smoking gun would now be turned upon him. To this very day, Paul is a patsy for the lawless. And look who came to his rescue, the Talmudim. Seems like they believed his claims to being Torah observant after all. And we continue reading Acts of the Apostles 14, 19. And there came thither certain Yahudim from Antioch who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, so they stone him, hence Deuteronomy 13, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the Talmudim stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Baranavi to Derbe. Wait, hold on. And of course, Barnavi would be Barnabas, in case you're curious. Wasn't Stephen stoned? Not a coincidence. There are various reasons as to why one might be stoned in the Torah, but nobody is accusing him of rape, adultery, sacrificing to Moloch, or any other crime in the pages of Moshe. The attempt on his life has everything to do with Deuteronomy 13. This isn't taught in churches, and you have to wonder why. Shaul is being accused, or Paul here, of blaspheming Moshe and claiming Torah, the Torah had been done away with, but those are blatantly false ones. If they were not false accusations, then their execution would have been justified. I want you to think about that. If he was advocating the Torah was done away with, according to the Torah, it was, a just, it was justified to stone him. But it wasn't justified to stone him. The mere fact that Allah Hayam spared him from death testifies to that fact. If you don't think those are the reasons for the attempt on his life, then keep reading because they have another go at it and even give their reasons. In Acts chapter 18, it says, when uh, Gallio was the deputy of uh, Achaia, the Yahudim made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship Allah Hayam contrary to the what? The Torah. There it is again, the false accusation. Persuading men to worship Allah Hayam contrary to the Torah is more language lifted directly from Deuteronomy 13 and no other chapter. At what point in Christian history do you suppose it was okay to persuade men to worship Allah Hayam by any law other than the one given by him? Certainly not in Paul's lifetime. Of course, he's after the cross. I mean, if we're to take Dr. Lucas's account into consideration, kind of makes you wonder about all the church leaders out there persuading men to stop being obedient to the Torah based upon Paul's example. But I'm sure they're the exception to the rule, right? I said, right? Continuing with Acts, uh, and Paul after this tarried there yet a good while and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Aram and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head, for he had a vow. Acts 18.18. 18. The first thing Paul does after being accused of leading people away from the Torah is shave his head. Why would he do that? It's a Nazarene vow as if that's not suspicious. Seems like an odd thing for Paul to do to, you know, convince the Yahudim or the Goyim to worship Yahuwah apart from Torah and then go, nah, -uh, at the accusations and take up the life of a Nazarene simply for the fun of it. What better way to show that he was set apart for Yahuwah according to Numbers chapter 6? Such a vow would have shown that he was in no way advocating that the Torah of Yahuwah had been done away with. He must have fallen from the grace of God then. That must be it. Apparently, Paul was all about living in spiritual bondage. 
you know, the Nazarene vow with his constant denials and shaving his head and all that. And when did you know it? Those very accusations followed him to Yerushalayim. Say it ain't so. And so we read this. And when we were come to Yerushalayim, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us into Yaakov and all the elders were present. And uh, this is act after Acts 15, too, after the Jerusalem Council. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things Allah Hayam had wrought among the other nations by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified Yah and said unto him, You see, brother, how many thousands of Yahudim there are which believe, and they are all zealous for the Torah. Hmm. And they are informed of you that you teach all the Yahudim, which are among the other nations, to forsake Moshe. Uh-oh. Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. It is Yaakov who backs him this time. The brother of Mashiach and leader of the Yerushalayim church transitions from praising all the Yahudim who are zealous for the Torah because of Paul's ministry to addressing the accusations concerning him by some of them, but you are made well aware of them by now. Paul was apparently teaching the Yahudim among the other nations to forsake Moshe. Did I miss anything? It's the same old, same old. And so here is Yaakov's suggestion. What is it, therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that you are come. Do, do therefore this that we say to you. We have four men which have a vow on them. Uh, them take and purify yourself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads. There it is again. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and guard the Torah. Let me say that again. Uh, that, that you yourself, that they would know that you yourself, Paul, also walk orderly and guard the Torah. Paul was expected to shave his head again. And yes, that is another reference to the Nazarene vow, in case you were wondering. The reason why he would be asked to do it is even explained to us. Yaakov states it is so that all the accusations might fall to the roadside. Paul did indeed walk orderly guarding the Torah. To walk in a disorderly manner would be not to guard the Torah, according to Yaakov. But neither he nor the elders of the Yerushalayim church believe his disorderly conduct to be the case, obviously. Seems to me that Paul could never shave his head enough, though, because this is like the second time it's happened, because the accusations kept on coming and coming, following him in nearly every Christian congregation, even unto this very day. Perhaps that is why Kepha thought to mention him in a letter. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suff suffering of Yahweh is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, is written unto you, as also in all his suffering, all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable pervert as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away to the error of the lawless, you can see the error of the Torahless, fall from your own steadfastness. Uh, steadfastness. 2 Peter 3, 14 through 17. Did you catch that? Paul wrote letters. But not only that, they contained within them some things which were difficult to understand. He then quickly claims that unlearned and unstable men would pervert his letters just as they do with the other scriptures and that such perversion would lead to their own destruction. I am often told by Christians proclaiming the gospel of lawlessness that it is I who does the scripture twisting. They will wag Kepha in my face and claim I am unlearned in my reading and that if I understood the Torah properly, I would also conclude, as Paul apparently did, that it is to be broken rather than obeyed. Well, isn't that adorable? Never one for confusion. Kepha goes so far as to define the error of those doing the twisting. Keep reading. He says to beware of those who would lead you away with the error of lawlessness. And as you know, that's the same thing as being without Torah or Torahless. And precisely what the masses on the wide road of existence happen to claim. Not a coincidence. Kepha is warning about the people who read Paul's letters and conclude that being Torahless 
is what Roman Catholic and Protestant Jesus wants from us. Amazing how his story keeps repeating itself. To claim Torah has been done away with because Paul apparently said so in one of in one letter or another or whatever uh, is to agree with the same temple controllers who strung Mashiach up on a tree. Moving forward, we should be cautious about making the same mistake. All right, continuing with Galatians 1.14. And profited in Judaism above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So, bio time. There are entire books written on the man which attempt to fill in the pieces of his upbringing, as well as the missing years between 33 AD, the proposed year of his conversion. And so the idea is Yehusha Mashiach was crucified in 30, Paul's converted in, uh, in uh, 33, and the beginning of his writing career nearly 20 years later. So what happened in those 20 years? I've read some of them, the biographies, I mean, in every instance that I can recall, theologians portray an apostle who gave the Torah to some, as roadside directions go, and a Torahless guidebook to others. So much for passing the Deuteronomy 13 test, if that's the case. You should know then that they've all sent me spiraling in the anti-Paul direction, every last one of them. Not more than a month ago, just before I started writing this commentary, uh, I made yet another attempt at a bio of his just to keep fresh on what people are saying about Paul. And guess what happened? I found myself sliding down the helter skelter into the anti Paul camp all over again. Yes, I came this close to rounding up a posse of my peers, aching for another trial. Cut the crap out, theologians. Deuteronomy 13 and rebelling against the Torah, you can't have it both ways and still hold hands without catching chlamydia or gonorrhea. The word I'd like to focus upon today is zealous. Paul rose up through the ranks of Judaism, the denominational religion of the Pharisees, surpassing many of his own peers due to his zeal for the traditions of his fathers. And that would be uh, yet another reference to the oral Talmud, just so we're clear. And it had been begun to be written down at that time. And of course, never is his zeal more evident than with his persecution of the way. His zeal comes up often in his own flashback segments, and I don't doubt it for a moment. Consider Paul's recollection as recorded by his own biographer, Luke. And he uh, says, uh, this is uh, Paul speaking here in uh, Ma'asim. I am truly a man, although a Yehudi, born of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the ancestral laws and was zealous towards Allah Hayam, as ye all are this day. That comes from 22.3. There is the zeal again. We also glean that he was raised in Tarsus and that he was later schooled under Gamaliel. This same Gamaliel the elder was the grandson of the famed Jewish rabbi Hillel the elder, though he was also named, known as Hillel the Babylonian, yikes. Hillel was uh, instrumental in the development of the Talmud, and it is said that Gamaliel kept to his traditions. So, I mean, Paul is front and center there in the development of the Talmud. That right there explains Paul's own education, the moose-sized headache of indoctrination which he had to break from, including the people whom he was in deep with, too deep. These were undoubtedly the Judaizers who haunted him in the synagogues, trolling him on nearly every street corner of the local ghetto. The rumors may very well be true. For all I know, they may have jumped a few of his converts in the back alleyways of Damascus, lifting their togas to ensure the uh, give me some skin line was enforced. Think about it, though. Paul was capable of leaving his family estate in Tarsus to learn with the Holy City rollers, and that's no small task. Whether he derived from a wealthy family or not is debated. I see evidence for both. I suspect they had money, but that's just my opinion. Another opinion of mine is that Paul was frustrated in having to take up tent making again, a laborious process for quote unquote common people, something he very well may not have done while smoking stogies in the back room with the big boys, you know, back with the Pharisees with Gamaliel. Well, that's what happened when you upset the establishment. You're kicked back out to the street and have to start learning the trade for yourself. Speaking of that two decades of silence, another argument by the 
the uh, the quote unquote scholars pertain to whether uh, uh, first and second Thessalonians that'd be Thessalonikim, Rishon and Sheni first and second Thessalonians and first and second Corinthians or Galatians was first written uh, was his first written letter which is it I have no bone in this fight let you know let the dogs fight it out though the years 48 through 51 all seem to be agreed upon that he wrote these letters in those few short years uh, first second corinthians first second thessalonians and galatians of the 27 books in new testament canon 13 are attributed to paul 14 if we include hebrews but i don't um, i am frankly surprised when others do and approximately half of the acts of the apostles shifts its focus to deal entirely with Paul's missionary journeys. What I do think is worth noting is that only seven of his letters are accepted by the scholars as being authentic. That is dictated by Paul himself. A common think tank companion is that Paul's followers compiled material from his surviving letters, which no longer survive, uh, though were still available during the war of the Yahudim or in its aftermath to compile the others. So the idea was that, yeah, he wrote all these letters. He, the, we only have uh, seven of the 13 are actually ones that Paul actually wrote. And the others were like compiled from a multitude of letters by his followers after the, the uh, war of the Jews. Currently, I have no bo bone in that fight. fight uh, excuse me. Currently, I have no bone in that fight either. And I'm fine with either result. It really doesn't bother me either way. The truth is the truth, and I want it. I mean, if Paul's followers did compile his letters as a labor of love, then that is to be commended, though we must also be on the lookout for any insertions of the lawless Paul Patsy. On the subject of his letters, as well as how that potentially ties in with his family wealth, they appear to have been penned in Koine Greek, the tongue of the common folk. I am told that writing epistles for the purposes of theological correction was a common practice among the Pharisees of his day. Therefore, he may have very well written various others uh, before the Damascus incident, meaning he may have written uh, letters as a Pharisee that you know he didn't even want to keep included, and the Jews wouldn't have wanted to keep those. Though they would derive from the Talmudic tradition, obviously. Frankly, what epistles we do possess would have been shrugged off as a dime a dozen among his contemporaries. We never would have known about them had he not switched sides at the right place and time in his story. Supposing he never became a convert but remained with the Pharisee party, then had they even survived the war in uh, 70 AD war, we would expect them to remain among the thousands of other untranslated documents lying around in an underground vault. I, I seriously, I've heard that there are thousands of first century letters like in vaults in Jerusalem. Uh, and they're just like untranslated. You have to figure there's some really good gems in there. Contrast Paul's letters with the elegant literary Greek of his own contemporary, the Yehudi philosopher Philo of Alexandria. Philo wrote expansively on the intersection of philosophy, politics, and religion, paying careful attention to the crossroads between Platonism and late Second Temple Judaism. Paul and Philo simply don't compare. Not simply in their literary functionality, but the mere scope of the writing. Or how about the masterful penmanship of Yosef ben Matityahu, a.k.a. Flavi, uh, Flavi, uh, Flavius Josephus, or you know, everyone knows him as Josephus. Many of you will think I am being unfair, seeing as how Josephus was planting his bum on a cushion, surrounded by draperies being well financed by the Caesars, perhaps so. But then what about Matthew, the tax collector? He stepped up to the plate, wrote his gospel as a one-off, and it was a grand slam. Or how about Yochanan, the fisherman? That would be John. With no prior evidence for the literary chops, he penned the stunningly beautiful Bezora of Yochanan, not overlooking uh, Yochanan Rishon, that would be First John and Revelation. And need I mention Yaakov, or James, the son of a carpenter? His short epistle drips like honey. My point in all of this is not by any means to belittle Paul. If anything, it is to illustrate his zealousness. No doubt the rise through the ranks uh, mentality, which inspired him to become the pit bull for the temple controllers, leading to the persecution of the way, had the same concentrated effort in his con conversion. He simply wasn't content sitting in the pews. That wasn't for him. 
Nothing wrong with that. And again, I'm not challenging his status as an apostle. Really, I'm not. It's just that the man made one attempt after another at fleshing out letters. Are they good letters? I mean, is the writing effective? Sure, he shows all the signs of being an intellectual, perhaps even a brilliant thinker, though they are confusing as, as hell, or as I should say confusing as Sheol. Proof is in the pudding. 99% of the world's population reads them and thinks it is Yahuwah's will that we no longer remain obedient to his Torah. The fruit of Paul's ministry is that many, many, many souls have managed to slide right off the narrow path towards destruction. Yes, I would say that is confusing. Nobody picks Philo's brain and comes to Christianity's conclusions regarding Paul. The same can be said of the other New Testament writers. The diehard Pollyanity groupies don't like the epistles of Peter, of James, of Jude, of John, because their laser-eyed focus upon the Torah is an undeniable one. I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised to learn that the term cherry picker originates with his lawless fan base, because they are the masters at it. Paul was zealous. He tried hard, harder than most. But in the end, he wasn't the greatest writer. To be more precise, he was a confusing writer. The last part isn't my words. Those words come directly from Peter. And we read that a few minutes ago. Take it up with him. He straight up called his writings confusing. And again, we're, we'll actually, uh, uh, you can see I actually wrote this out of order. I'm going to, uh, we'll get to Peter again uh, in chapter two. We'll be talking more about Peter's uh, uh, discussion on Paul from Second Peter. We will turn to his warnings concerning the confusing nature of Paul's letters soon enough. Just know that I'm convinced, mostly convinced, that Keith never really fully understood Paul either. Understanding Paul was a struggle on the page, probably in person too. The majority of the Jerusalem group would likely confer, concur. Probably very few did uh, get him or got him. And sadly, far fewer do today. Indeed, he is a living, living, breathing document exemplifying the final exam, Deuteronomy 13. Rather ironically, Paul's writing is a test which lends to the biases of one's heart. And for the record, I also happen to believe that Yahuwah designed it that way. He did actually designed Paul to be a test. Um, I think it's all part of the divine plan. All right, Galatians 1, 15 through 16. You can see a few spelling errors in here. There's not many, but there's a few. I haven't edited it yet. But when it pleased Allah Hayam, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the brethren, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Anti-Paulers will use this passage in their pileup of surmounting evidence to claim that he is outing himself as a false prophet maybe even the Antichrist. The reason being is that he states, to reveal his son in me. Wait, hold up. Slow down the expanding waistline of this here Bible belt. Wasn't the son revealed only a few short years earlier in the son? Did the father also reveal his son in Kepha, Yochanan, Matathyahu, Yaakov, and the others of his crew? Or was it just the son? Christians have read this phrase so often that it has become a fixed within their doctrine and to the point that they wouldn't even think to question. In fact, there must be something wrong with anyone who does, who actually looks at this and goes, wait a second. I, for one, am of the opinion that Paul is wildly misunderstood, though on the flip of that coin, I do confess the verbiage is odd, to say the least. I've shopped around and the Christ in me mantra appears to be exclusively appalling doctrine. I can't find anywhere else in the Bible the idea of Christ in me. In fact, I would think that Christ consciousness, the whole idea of Christ consciousness uh, derives from this verse. In other epistles, such as Colossians 1, 24 through 27, Paul mentions Mashiach and you, prompting the anti paulers to claim the spirit of Antichrist is floating around like something out of invasion of the body snatchers. I actually agree in part. I mean, isn't that what Yochanan says? He says, uh, chapter 4, Beloved, believe not every Ruach, but try the Ruachoth, whether they are of Allah Hayam, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Ruach Allah Hayam. Every Ruach that confesses that Yahushua HaMashiach is come in the flesh is of Allah Hayam. 
And every Ruach that confesses not that Yahushua HaMashiach has come in the flesh is not of Allah Hayam. And this is the Ruach of anti, uh, anti-Mashiach or Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. That comes from 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Sort of, not, not really. Paul and Yochanan aren't actually saying the same thing. But then come to think of it, they actually fall into agreement. As is the usual case, this will require explanation. Let's start with what Yochanan is claiming. He says that anybody who denies Mashiach came in the flesh is the Ruach of anti-Mashiach. A lot of people think he's talking about the Gnostics, many of which claim Christ within, which on the surface sounds a lot like what Paul suggests, though I don't see any evidence that they were a threat quite yet or that they had even fallen on Yochanan's radar to begin with. No, the most obvious contexts are the Yahudim. Those would be the Jews, specifically those embodied by the Pharisees. It's not that the Pharisees were saying Yahushua didn't historically exist. No, they were saying Yahushua was not Mashiach, and therefore that the Mashiach had not yet arrived in the flesh. They were rejecting Yahuwah, the very Allah Hayam whom they claimed as their own. Their entire religion, Judaism, with its Talmudic restraints, were completely opposed to and in the place of Yahushua, our high priest. There is your Antichrist religion. That's what John is talking about there, that they were the ones saying that Mashiach cannot come in the flesh. The Pharisees. Now, view what I've just explained in light of Paul's declaration, that Allah Hayam called him by his grace to, quote, to reveal his son in me, unquote. Consider who is on his mind at the moment. The provocateurs in his audience are the Pharisees. I can't state this enough. The whole epistle, Galatians, makes sense if you understand this. They are the ones with the false gospel. They are the ones who don't accept Yahushua as Mashiach. They are the ones trying to infiltrate and ultimately capsize Paul's ministry, as well as the Christian church, by institutionalizing Talmudic policies among the very goyim who are entering the synagogues because the goyim believe Yahushua as Mashiach, whereas they do not. The Pharisees don't believe it. The goyim do, coming into the Asherel. And what does that tell you? Paul was not creating a separate religion, not in the slightest. He was bringing the goyim into the Hebrew faith. The Pharisees didn't like that. They wanted the Goyim to enter a certain way, their way. They wanted the Hebrew faith to reflect their branding of it, which is Judaism. There were many religions in the pagan world. Had Paul actually created a new religion apart from the Torah, then the Pharisees would have left them alone. Think about it. It makes sense. But no, they hounded him. Why is that? Make no mistake, modern-day Judaism is their religion. You could look this up on Wikipedia. It is an anti-Mashiach religion. There is your Ruach of anti, uh, Antichrist roaming through the churches. This is why I have concluded that many uh, that many misunderstand Paul's quote. Yes, it is oddly worded, uh, Christ in me. But here is my suggestion. In saying Mashiach is revealed in me, he is ultimately separating himself from his uh, Pharisee contemporaries. He is separating himself from their Talmudic traditions, as well as the teachings of Gamaliel, whose feet he sat under. Mashiach is not revealed through them, obviously. Paul is saying, allow me to teach you the Torah because it is Mashiach rather than men who has instructed me in the very heart of it. To further emphasize my point, the seemingly unique Pauline doctrine of remaining in Yehusha HaMashiach, or Mashiach and me, uh, Mashiach and you, relies upon the fruit of the Ruach HaKadosh among the faithful. And of course, I'm sure you're all aware that the fruit is a stand-in for work. If there is no fruit slash work to be found, or that said fruit slash work is deemed rotten, then there is no evidence of the Torah. Mashiach is not in them, or in slightly other terms, they are not in Mashiach. I, so if I could sum this up, I really think he's saying, yes, I'm a, I am a representative of Mashiach. Okay. Uh, he, he has revealed himself in me, um, but not in the way people are stating. He's like, he's, he's thinking about how he came out of the Pharisee religion and now he's looking back in the Torah and he's seeing Mashiach and he's saying, he's using me to reveal Mashiach in the one true gospel. All right. Uh, next verse, verse 17. 
Neither went I up to Yerushalayim to them which were apostles before me, but I, but I went into Arav and returned again unto Damascus. Readers have long commented upon the striking difference between Paul's own recollections of the days preceding his road to Damascus moment and those of his biographer, the suggestion being that they do not agree. Luke has Paul traveling to Yerushalayim to visit the apostles, whereas Paul straight up says he did no such thing. What gives? Seeing as how everything Paul says is shady as Shaul, we should read the apparent contradiction for ourselves to see if we can make sense of Paul's alibi. And so uh, we're going to read again from Acts of the Apostles. This is chapter 9. This concerns his uh, the road uh, to Damascus moment or immediately afterwards. And straightway he preached Mashiach in the synagogues that he is the son of Elohim or Allah Hayam. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Yerushalayim and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound into the chief parts? So it's amazing. Everyone's mind is going back to like, how, like, is this the guy who was just like with the Pharisees persecuted? Like, how can we trust this guy? This doesn't seem legit. This doesn't seem real. What's going on with this? They're just all perplexed. But Shaul increased the more in strength and confounded the Yahudim which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Mashiach. I read from this earlier tonight. And, if, and after that, many days were fulfilled. The Yahudim took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known to Shaul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the Talmudim took him by the night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Shaul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the Talmudim. Wait, what? Talmudim, Talmudim, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a Talmud. Luke has Paul remaining at Damascus after his conversion, entering the synagogue to prove Yahusha is Mashiach. Many days pass on the sundial. We are then told that the Yahudim were confounded at Paul's case of the backward somersault, so much so that they took counsel to kill the flip-flopping gymnast. They even laid in wait by the gates of the city, hoping to nab him on his way out, in or out. Somebody in the know let the secret out. His escape involved the Talmudim lowering him down the wall of the city in a basket. But which Talmudim are we talking about? They couldn't possibly have been Yaakov, Kifa, and company, because then seemingly in the next breath, we have Paul journeying to Yerushalayim, hoping to fill out a membership application and join himself to Yahusha's entourage. Clearly, there are two groups of Talmudim present. The first group would be the Talmudim of Damascus, the second of Yerushalayim. Those of Damascus were confounded by his narrative flip, whereas those of Yerushalayim didn't even believe he was legitimate. But then there is still the issue of Luke having Paul return to Yerushalayim after Damascus, wherein Paul claims he did no such thing. Actually, the next several verses of Galatians all seem to contradict the order of events given in Maasim, but only upon the surface. Critics can say what they like. They can create contradictions where there are none. Critics are great at stuff like that. Social media critics, I have found, are like dogs who chew on a play toy, but then turn on it one day and rip it apart to shreds. They are like children torn apart by divorce. They choose one parent to villainize, whereas the other has the saint sainthood placed upon them. Paul often receives a short end of the stick. Everything he says or does is shady as Sheol. I say that a lot. It's a great line, though. Even his apparent trip to the Arabian desert. The line reads, And when Shaul was come to Yerushalayim, telling us we are jumping from one scene in the narrative to another. Shaul was, Shaul was come. He finally arrived. Are there hours, days, months, or years missing between the scene of Paul's life and another? We are not told. Actually, that's not when the three years in Arav even happened. I was simply seeing if you were paying attention. Paul states, I went into Arav and returned uh, again to Damascus, telling us that Lucas's line, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Yahudim took counsel to kill him, would be the best fit for his absence. He taught in the synagogues, confounding his contemporaries, left for the Arabian desert to clear his head, probably seeking answers to his questions, and then returned. Lucas's interest is in relating Paul's relationship with the apostles, not scripting a montage of every falafel stand he visited along the way. Though to be fair, Paul is outlining his relationship with the apostles as well. Why does Paul mention his trip to the Arabian desert then when Luke does not? Ah, now that is a good question. First of all, give me four separate, separate biographers 
and I will show you the very different stylistic stories that they tell. Well, look no further than the four canonical gospels. The details vary. And in, in the instance of Yochanan, entirely different recollections are given. Yes, Paul is presenting an ante um, anecdote which pertains to his uncertain relationship with the Twelve, though he is also recount recounting how his theology developed, hence his epistle to the Galatians, and a large part of it developed in the Arabian uh, desert. I'll get to it. Many have considered his three years in the Arabian desert to be a complete and utter failure. He seemingly saw absolutely no success there. I stress seemingly because even the failed missionary journey is at best a surface level evaluation. Every person is confronted with failure. Only the successful person learns how to rise above them using their experiences as teaching tools. And of course, in Hebrew, there are no coincidences. Regarding his many questions, which the parishing no doubt pressed upon him, the circumcision issue was on the top of his list. The Arabian desert gave him the answer that he sought. Now I'm going to read to you from the epistle of Barnabas. But you will say, but surely the people were circumcised as a seal. He's saying, oh, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, but the, but the, the, the people were, you know, uh, they received circumcision as a seal, right? But every Syrian and Arabian and all the idol worshiping priests are also circumcised. Does this mean that they too belong in their covenant? Why even Mitzrayim practices circumcision? Of course, Mitzrayim would be Egypt. And that's actually all well documented. The best explanation I've ever read was given to us by Bar Navi, that would be Barnabas, Paul's missionary buddy. And look at the case being made. The men of Arav were already circumcised when Paul got there. Those would be the children of Yishmael, by the way. They were descendants of Abraham through Hagar. And that this is going to come up later, I think, in chapter 4 of Galatians. Uh, we'll see what, what Paul learned there in the Arabian Desert regarding the, the children of Abraham and Hagar. They were circumcised. Did they want to enter into a covenant relationship with Yahuwah, the Alahayam of their father Abraham? Paul received no traction there. They wanted nothing to do with the Alahayam of Yasharel. To the Yishmaelites, Paul was, Paul was the Judaizer. Only some of you will savor that last sentence. It seems as though Barnabas appreciated what Luke did not. Even if his resulting emotions weighed him down over the following decades, as baggage often does, yes, Paul had baggage. No, you know, no, no doubt in my mind about that. Paul's missionary journey to Arabia was anything but a failure. Not overlooking the Syrians as well as many Egyptian men, they too were circumcised. I checked. The present rate of circumcision in the United States is 81%. That's a lot of Torah-obedient folk, wouldn't you say? Why is my every encounter with Christians on the street a representation of the other 19%, the uncircumcised? They all proclaim a bazaar of lawlessness. Have the circumcised entered into Yahuwah's covenant as well? Obviously not. Therefore, circumcision cannot possibly be a seal of salvation. His three years in the Arabian desert taught him that. It is that message which, upon his return to Damascus, resulted in a death sentence. He was like, hey guys, I just went to Arabia, and all those Ishmaelites were there, they're circumcised, and they don't follow the Torah. And it's like, stone him, you know, that kind of thing. You know, just basically speaking the obvious. All right. Thank you all guys for hanging in there tonight. Galatians 1, 18 through 19. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Kepha and abode with him 15 days. But the other, the apostles, saw a nun, save Yaakov, Adonai's brother. The three years spoken of can be taken in various different ways. I have seen commentators refer to his three years in the Arabian desert or Contrarily, his three years in Damascus after returning from Arabia. From my perspective, the three years may very well reflect the span of time from his road to Damascus moment, insinuated in Galatians 1, 15 through 16, to his eventual meeting of Kepha and Yaakov in Yerushalayim. So there were three years between, with everything else packed between. His journey to Arabia 
bookended on either end by Damascus, would fill in the space between, which is to say, there is no telling how long he spent among the circumcised of Yishmael. Confusion abounds here as well because, once again, the biographical details differ from Luke's retelling in Egypt. Oh man, not again. I've already quoted from uh, chapter 9, 20 through 26 and given explanation, which is sufficient in the very least for me. The sour grapes will never be happy. And the rotten apples will continue inviting everyone into their barrel for a dance into the fire party. I suppose what we ought to do is pick the narrative back up in Ma'asim and see if we can make sense of this confusion. So uh, this is from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, continuing, but not but Bar Navi, that'd be Barnabas again, took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen Adonai in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Yahusha. And he was with them coming in and going out at Yerushalayim. And he spoke boldly in the name of Adonai Yahusha and disputed against the Yavanim. Uh, those would be the Greeks. But they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to um, Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Uh, Acts of the Apostles 9, 27 through 30. I'm personally convinced that this is the same event which Paul describes in Galatians 1, 18 through 19. You are free to come to your own conclusions. Again, Paul is rehearsing one account and his biographer the other. Many historians cite the year 70 through 90 for the writing of Ma'asim, and I couldn't disagree more. I am of the opinion that Acts was written before Paul died, and that, in fact, the entire New Testament was completed well before the 70, 70 AD mile marker. Had he written it afterwards, then his martyrdom under Nero would surely have been mentioned. Look at how the official copy of Acts ends, why don't you? It says this, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of Allah Hayam and teaching those things which concern the Adonai Yehusha HaMashiach with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28, the end. Apparently, Luke finishes his biography with Paul under house arrest, and they all lived happily ever after. Way to leave us hanging, Luke. He doesn't even get around to discussing Paul's missionary journey to Britain, which was advertised in, in Romans. Uh, Acts 29, what is also referred to as the missing chapter of Acts, delves into those details. And yes, I believe it's legitimate. Here's how Lucas's book ends in actuality. This is quoting from Acts 29. And they went forth and came into uh, Illyricum, intending to go by Ma Macedonia into Asia. And grace was found in all the called out assemblies, and they prospered and had peace. Amen. There's your amen. Still not reading anything about Paul's death. Apparently, when Luke dotted the final jot and tittle, complete with an amen, all seemed to be going well for the called out assemblies. He says they were prospering in shalom. That's how these things always start, don't they? With the oohs and ahs, but then they end with the running and the screaming. Or in the case of Paul, at the crossroads of a stretched out neck and an axe. According to the same tradition, Luke aged some 84 years and then died in uh, uh, Boeotia, a region in central Greece. The claim is that he was furthermore buried in a tomb in Thebes, though isn't it interesting that no such tomb has ever been found in the his story of Christendom. Furthermore, had he lived to an old age, as is the claim, what are the chances that he would have gotten his hands on the epistle of Galatians? I'm not convinced in the slightest that he had it at his disposal when he wrote Acts. I really don't. And I hope you guys understand what I'm getting at here. I, I, he's he's not just, he's not looking at Galatians. He's coming up with, you know, he's looking at other sources. My point here is that Luke's account of Paul's time in Jerusalem was a perspective which did not include full awareness of his activities. His claim that Paul was coming in and going out among the apostles is a generalization. It speaks of Luke's knowledge that he was there and that it was furthermore an important time in his ministry, but then we are pressed to consider whether he was unaware of which apostles he actually met with and how many for that matter. That's not to say the two documents lack harmony. The Gospels offer the same variance, which, as I mentioned, is perfectly acceptable where eyewitnesses are involved. Well, getting back to Galatians 1, 18 through 19, sort of. Paul calls Yaakov an apostle. Well, isn't that interesting? And how do you figure their meeting went down? It had to be an awkward one for sure. I mean, considering how upon their last meeting, Paul straight up attempted to murder Yaakov. Here's how the scene went down. 
And when matters were at the at that point that they should come and be baptized, some of our enemies entering the temple with a few men. So the, the scene here is that Yaakov and the apostles are in the temple teaching Mashiach to the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the, the teachers of the law. And they're actually converting people and people are getting ready. Like, yeah, they're amped. Like, yes, Yahushua was Mashiach. Uh, uh, with a few men began to cry out and to say, what mean ye, O men of Yashorel? Why are you so easily hurried on? Why are you led headlong by most miserable men who are deceived by Simon, a magician? While he was thus speaking and adding more to the same effect, and while Yaakov the bishop was refuting him, he began to excite the people and to raise a tumult so that the people might not be able to hear what was said. This man yelling uh, is, is Paul. Therefore, he began to drive all into confusion with shouting and to undo what had been arranged with much labor and at the same time to reproach the priest and to enrage them with re revilings and abuse and like a madman to excite everyone to murder, saying, what are you doing? Why do you hesitate? Oh, sluggish and inert. Why do we not lay hands upon them and pull all these fellows to pieces? When he had said this, he first, seizing a strong brand from the altar, set the example of smiting. Then others also, seeing him, were carried away with like readiness. Then ensued a tumult on either side of the beating and the beaten. Much blood was shed. There was a confused fight in the midst of which that enemy attacked Yaakov and threw him headlong from the top of the steps. And supposing him to be dead, he cared not to inflict further violence upon him. That comes from Ha Ayalalim Yaakov or the Ascent of James 27. We're all aware of Stephen's death by stoning, but also the fact that you know who consented to it. Well, here is where Shaul the Zealot applied for the position. He straight up threw Yaakov headlong from the top of the temple steps, supposing him to be dead. Yaakov couldn't catch a break, could he? Seeing as how he was supposedly flung from the temple in a later decade. And that's apparently how he died in the 60s. Poor Yaakov. If you've ever wondered why Paul didn't return right away to Yerushalayim, that right there is a good reason as any. And do you suppose Kepha would even agree to meet with the new convert unless he first repented of what he'd done to the person he'd done it to, the leader of the Yerushalayim church? Recompense, it's in the Torah. The meeting with Yaakov would have come first. It, wouldn't, it wasn't like Kepha was like, okay, you come spend a couple weeks with me and then we'll get around to Yaakov. It's like, no, 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 no. You go to Yaakov. You work this out with him, and then if he approves, you come. You can follow me around. The following two weeks with Kifa would have followed. I can't imagine any other scenario where the situation would be reversed. And so, on the matter of visiting Kifa, a more literal phrase would have been to make acquaintance with, with rather than to see. The reason I say that is because the Greek word which Paul used to describe their meeting is his uh, historisai. It means visiting someone with the distinct purpose of obtaining information. Contextually, that makes the most amount of sense. Seeing as how Paul spent 15 days with him, he could have said two weeks, but no, 15 days is a precise number. Kifa appears to have offered Paul a ride-along program, a hyper-paced mentorship of sorts. Knowing what we do of Paul's activities, I suspect, because we know he went around to synagogues on the Sabbath, I suspect they met in the synagogue on a Sabbath. There's your 15 days. Their, fifth, their final meeting would have been in a Sabbath synagogue as well, counting for the extra day uh, instead of 14. Barnabas introduced Paul to Kepha and possibly Yaakov, though Kepha is the one who agreed to allow Paul to tail him, perchance teaching him a trick or, uh, of the trade or two in the process. That should cause us to reevaluate what Paul was getting at earlier in 116 when stating. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. The anti-Paulers will, will use this to claim Paul was unteachable, that he refused the advice or advances of the Twelve in favor of his own Bezorah, and that he was once more being disrespectful, as is apparently the norm. That's not what he says, though. Immediately plays into his timeline in so much that he went right into the synagogues so as to proclaim his uh, instantaneous life-changing experience. He had already conferred with flesh and blood for the entirety of his life, being schooled by the Pharisees, and they were obviously wrong in their conclusions. 
flesh and blood is more of a reference to them rather than the apostles. I did, I, I did not confer with flesh and blood. All right. Consider what he says in another place. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6.12. A simple cross-reference helps to clarify what Paul was getting at. He had once been a card-carrying member of the flesh and blood department, but now they were at odds with each other, more like at war. Why would he confer with them? In actuality, Paul did confer with Kepha and learned from him, Yaakov as well which is why we have details such as the following. This comes from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Mashiach died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Kepha, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of Yaakov, then of the apostles. At last of all, he, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the called out assembly of Allah Hayam, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 9. Incredible. Paul cites Kepha and Yaakov without naming anyone else. We have already seen the reason. None of the other 12 were willing to be interviewed. Perhaps they were still skeptical of Paul, seeing as how everything he said or did was shady as Sheol. Or, or perhaps they were simply indisposed at the moment. Who really knows? I mean, they could have been, you know, Thomas could have been in India by now. Uh, Andrew could have been up in somewhere in Greece. Notice how there is no mention of Miriam of Migdol being the first to see the resurrected Mashiach, if only he conferred with Yochanan. Point is, he received eyewitness testimony from Kepha and also from Yaakov. His own testimony is consistent in 1 Corinthians as well as Galatians, including the gratitude Paul would have felt while shadowing Kepha for 15 days. I mean, here he states, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the called out assembly of Allah Hayam. That's a personal reflection of his time spent with the apostles, specifically with, with Peter, with Kepha. By the way, it's one thing to be forgiven. It's another entirely to forgive yourself. Imagine the remorse Paul must have felt, meeting not only the congregants whom he terrorized, based, of course, on false accusations, but Yahusha Hamashiach's own brother. Would you have thought yourself worthy? There may have been Paul's greatest lesson in the grace of al Hayam, being forgiven by Yaakov. All right, I'm going to end it there tonight. My voice is starting to give way. And um, I know that I know I'm kind of being repetitive in this and saying things over and over and over again. And I kind of have to week after week after week. And I'm sorry for that. I feel like I have to. Um, I've learned that if you don't, then you, if you don't say it once, then someone runs all over you. Um, so, anyways, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. We'll pick this up next week. And uh, maybe we'll make it to chapter two next week. I'm not really sure. And, um, yeah, so if you got, I'm going to invite everybody out uh, if you haven't come before to the uh, the tour portions, which we uh, read every Friday night, starting at nine o'clock Eastern. And of course, this is what uh, Yaakov James said in Acts chapter fifteen that all the new Christians coming in, that you know we can give them mercy and grace and and know that they're going to begin uh, being obedient, uh, or at least that's the hope that they will. Because they're going to go into the synagogues every single week and hear Moses being read. Now, why don't we go to the synagogues today? Well, that will be probably explained in chapter two and why the you know the the, the followers of the way of Mashiach finally broke away from the synagogues is because of the Pharisees. I mean, it was it would have been awful. I mean, imagine having to go to get your Sabbath rest every week, going to a synagogue. Amongst the, the Pharisees who are just, you know, breathing down your neck and, you know, are you circumcised? All this kind of stuff. You're not saved. And that's the other thing. We're going to talk more about circumcision in the coming weeks. And um, I, I once you kind of break that, once you understand what Paul was truly getting at, it, like Christianity, they run with this. Like, oh, he's saying you don't have to, you, um, circumcision doesn't lead to salvation. Therefore, I don't have to be circumcised. Like, no, that's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. He's saying that it, 
It is not an act of salvation, which is completely different to being obedient. All right. Anyways, I'm going to end there tonight. And uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> looks like there will be some interesting comments in there. Um, I'm not able to read them as I'm reading from my own um, um, script, obviously. All right, guys. Um, we'll do this again next week. And I'll see you guys this Friday. Shalom.